And what I'm going to say today is a little bit uh, of things that may apply to you or do not apply to you. And that's why I think I want to appeal to your imagination, but also to your sense of how to think about these things within the context of what you do here in the UK. Um, and the, uh, I want to start by reviewing how we've thought about this topic of bilingualism. Uh, and we have uh, thought about this topic from an, um, mostly a North American point of view, certainly a Western point of view. Um, and because most of the scholarship that has come out in this field has been, uh, has come out of North America, ignoring, of course, the experiences of millions of Africans, millions of Asians, for whom bilingualism and multilingualism is a lot more complex and a lot more uh, demanding than uh, the way in which we have thought about it from a monolingual point of view. And I think what I want to say is part of our problems is that even when we think of, about bilingualism, we're thinking about it from a monolingual, what I call a monoglossic point of view. So bilingualism has been uh, thought about as being of two kinds. One type of bilingualism is what he calls subtractive bilingualism. That is, you take a child's language, you sort of turn it around, make it disappear, and eventually what the school does is um, promote uh, another language, and that is subtracted, of course. Another way in which he helps us think about bilingualism is by suggesting that bilingualism is always additive. That is, you take a child who speaks one language, you add the school language, and you eventually come up with a child that has two balanced wheels. That is, two wheels that go in the same direction, that are balanced in some ways, and that is the way in which we have conceptualized bilingual education and ways of making children bilingual. But I want to say that in the 21st century, with what I call the collision of peoples and languages and cultures that has occurred, we can no longer afford to think about bilingualism that way. For me, bilingualism is a lot more than having two balanced wheels. It's really much more like an all-terrain vehicle. An all-terrain vehicle, whereas you see there, the um, wheels turn in different directions as they adapt to the ridges and the craters of communication. There is nothing balanced about this bilingualism. This bilingualism, which I call dynamic, is a way in which all bilinguals function. It is a point of view that is not monoglossic, it is heteroglossic. It starts out following back teens' conceptualizations. It starts out not from a monolingual perspective, but it thinks about bilingualism from a bilingual perspective, from the ways in which bilinguals really use their languages, which is a lot more complex and a lot more about really adapting to the terrain in which we function, to the communicative act, to the ridges and the craters with which we communicate. Sometimes turning our wheels in different directions, sometimes one going up, the other one going down, etc. This is another image that I like to uh, think uh, that project when I, uh, I am talking to people about dynamic bilingualism. It is the banyan tree that appears in my book. That's my book on the top. And I think of this banyan tree when I think of dynamic bilingualism because I want to appeal to the fact that this is a lot more complex than just two languages, that these language practices in which all bilinguals engage are completely interconnected, that it is what grounds us and allows us to develop as people, that just like that banyan tree, it is developmental and takes a very long time to develop. And this is a, a, a temple in Cambodia that some of you might recognize that is being protected by the, ba the banyan tree. And I like to think that uh, this dynamic bilingualism is indeed what protects the temple that is the child as we think about it. 
So what does it mean to think, to have a conceptualization of bilingualism that is not additive or subtractive, that is not monolingual or monoglossic, but one that is really centered in this dynamic bilingualism, in this heteroglossic bilingual point of view? Well, one of the things that, that language teachers would then have to contend with is that um, speakers and learners do not ever have English or, or another language, or they're never a speaker of, or a reader or a writer of English or another language, but rather what we do with languages is we use them. We do languages. That is why the term languaging has come into our profession. So the idea is that people use languages, do languages, have languaging, but they do not ever have language. And we do language to negotiate situations, and we have to think then as language teachers that when we teach, we do not ever get students to really have English or be English speakers, but that this language uh, learning is used and learned, language is used and learned, through practice in very specific social contexts over the course of a lifetime. It doesn't happen uh, instantly. It is never ending. It's a continuum that never ends. And that's why I like to think of these children for whom English is an additional language as emergent bilinguals. In the United States, we call these children limited English proficient students, the federal government does, and sometimes in our profession we call them English language learners. Some of the schools do. I like to think of them and I speak of them as emergent bilinguals for many reasons. One reason is that there are no categories of children. The idea that children are first categorized as English language learners and then declassified in the United States makes absolutely no sense. It is based on exams and uh, assessments that are completely arbitrary um, and the, the language continuum, that bilingual continuum, is a lot more complex and it is a continuum, it's not a category. People again uh, do this over the course of a lifetime. Uh, I also speak of emergent bilinguals because I think if you think of these children as emergent bilinguals, you will never leave behind their languages and their cultures. Because indeed what you're doing by uh, helping them develop English, use English over the course of a lifetime, is to make them bilingual. So bilingualism is what you do even if you do it in English only. And I think this is very important for everybody, for all teachers to remember. Um, so if you think back then at what they used to tell us about what is supposed to happen in a classroom when the conceptualization is that of subtractive or additive models of bilingualism, what they always told us was that, was that language separation is good, and what is called code switching is bad. So all over the world, teachers are confronted with this situation where they're trying to teach an additional language, and in doing so, supervisors, thinking of these subtractive and bilingual models, keep saying, you can only do it in X. Please never speak the child's mother tongue. What I want to tell you today is that if you really think of this bilingualism from this dynamic perspective, a perspective in which, just to remind you, what there is is using languages or languaging to adapt to the ridges and craters of communication, and where you really understand that the language practices of bilinguals are interconnected, then what you have to tend to in the classroom is what I call translanguaging. For me, it means a process of student or teacher use of bilingual, multiple discursive practices as sense-making, and I'm emphasizing sense-making, of learning or teaching in multilingual classrooms.